Welcome to the Academy Podcast, where our mission is to improve lives through education, information, and some cool stories. My name is Dr. Mark Guadagnoli. I'm a professor of neuroscience and neurology and the senior associate dean for faculty affairs at the Kirk Kikorian School of Medicine. Today, our guest is Brandon Collinsworth. Brandon is a Nike master trainer, a worldwide yoga specialist, and a PhD candidate in neuroscience. Perhaps most importantly, Brandon is a liver of life. He chooses to challenge himself on a regular basis, and he looks at each and every challenge as an opportunity for growth and an opportunity to contribute to others' growth as well. We invite you to join us as we travel through the mean streets of East Las Vegas to the jungles of Peru and the beauty of Bali, where challenge meets opportunity. I think you'll find this conversation remarkable, inspiring, and heartwarming. Brandon Collinsworth. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, man, I'm, I am incredibly excited for you to be here. Um, we go way back. We'll talk about that a little bit later. We're going to start with your where you are now, Okay. Uh, both professionally, personally, everything, and that's going to set the table. And then we're going to go back a little bit later and talk about where you came from because okay. I think it's a really interesting spice to the story. Awesome. Right? And, and the perspective. Right. It's yeah. we were talking about this over breakfast. The perspective of that is incredibly important. Right. As well. So so who are you, Brandon Collinsworth? All right. Great, great question. Always brings me into introspective space when I'm asked a question like that. You know, by the way, I wouldn't normally start this way because it's it's not a softball, but I yeah. know you'll handle it. Yeah. I mean, at the at my core, I'm a I'm a humanitarian. And I'm in service to humanity, and I live by Muhammad Ali's quote that says, service to others is the rent that we pay for our time here on Earth. And all of my other projects augment that, amplify that, and allow me to serve in different mediums. I also live by a quote that goes, define yourself in a way that can't be defined, and you are free. And so that's allowed me to play outside the box and play in many different roles. So currently, go ahead. No, no, I, I, I was oh, yeah. listening, but I, I was, I'm picking up my pen because <laughs> I knew I knew I should have my journal in front of me because I'm going to write down hey, quotes from yeah, you. Yeah, amazing. I, I always do. So yeah, okay. so um, I'm a I'm a godfather to my amazing godson Oakley. I'm an uncle to nine nieces and nephews. Now I'm a wow. global trainer, coach for Nike. Just finished my 10 year. Mark of being signed to the one of the biggest brands in the world for ten years, and you just signed a new contract with them, right? Just signed to a new a contract, whole series of videos, and, yeah, for yeah. Mental Health Day, yeah. and now pioneering the new mindset revolution mm-hmm. through Nike. Mm-hmm. Currently, executive consulting for Core Power Yoga, which is the largest yoga brand in the game, and then coaching and teaching all around the world. And then my my most passionate project is Warrior Retreats, which I had an honor to have you on my and pleasure. be a part of it. Yeah. And that right there is. The only curated rite of passage I know of that is not only 14 days, but starts in the Amazon jungle and goes to the Andes and brings a collective leadership base from around the world to really to, to tap into not only Peru, but most importantly, humanitarian service in the heart. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. I think about that that statement and as, as bold as that statement is. It doesn't capture what that experience is like, <laughs> right, you know? right. And and the thing, the one of the things that's interesting is that in peace, I was thinking about the warrior retreat this morning. Mm-hmm. The, I mean, so many incredible things, right? Machu Picchu, Huayna Picchu, being deep in the yeah. Amazon with the, with one of the tribes there who yeah. were amazing. <clears throat> but but probably one of the things that stuck out more than anything was the humanitarian. Yeah, I hope this is okay that I tell the story, but Please. I remember. Um, the first place that we went to, mm-hmm. and the the woman there, the nun who is as saintly as any human being <laughs> I've ever seen, walked this earth. Yeah, and like I, I never met Mother Teresa, but this woman reminded me of that, mm-hmm. right? Just the way that she walked. And we sat down at one point where a woman was lying down on a on a bench. She was older at this time, probably in her mid fifties. Mm-hmm. And she had been there since she was about 20. Mm-hmm. You remember this woman, right? Yeah. Her yeah. husband had gotten upset with her. He wanted to divorce her because um, he wanted to be with somebody else. And so he ended up throwing acid in her face, yeah. burning her eyes out of the sockets, burning her nose. I mean, it, it was horrific. 
And she was laying there, and when we were next to her, holding her hand, rubbing yep. her hair, and, and the crazy part was we were getting more out of that experience yeah. than she was, you know? Yeah. And, and I remember vividly being at one point, actually you took this picture, I believe, just laying there in the hot sun with one of the boys that was there, yeah. kind of crawled up in my lap and yep. I couldn't move, couldn't move. Yeah. And uh, I don't know what it was about the connection mm -hmm. with him, but, and it doesn't really matter, right? Yeah. But uh, all those remarkable, incredible adventures that we had, man, I'm feeling it right now. That's the power of yeah. warrior retreats. And there's a reason why I don't claim it to be mine, but more than that, I claim to just be a steward of what Peru opens up for us. Yeah. Because every time we go down there, it delivers the medicine that we need as leaders to like drop deeper into our hearts. And what I learned, you know, a lot of people go to Peru, especially right now with like Machu Picchu being so popular and plant medicine and ayahuasca being so popular. But I, I always call Peru life ayahuasca. Life ayahuasca yeah. being the vibration of Peru allows for transformation to happen. And I learned from my father after we were reunited so many years ago that service to others is alchemy. And going into the hospitals, when you come from our privileged Western backgrounds, and you see somebody like the woman who had acid thrown on her face to where her nose fell off and mm -hmm. it was like a skeleton almost. And she's smiling. Yeah. And she's exuding this, this radiance that sometimes gets overlooked. It changes people forever. I've seen so many people crack. The toughest ones, as soon as they get to the hospitals, they crack. And that's why we go so hard for Peru, especially for our charity give backs, because it's that moment where you step into the hospitals and all of a sudden it's no longer about you, but it is all about you at the same time. It's about connecting right. to a deeper part of you. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting that you say that because I, I think about this just even in the short conversation. You talk about what you do as a person. We talk about the, the experiences in Peru. We mm -hmm. talk about warrior retreat. You, I mean, you, you do a beautiful job of explaining things. But I don't think even you can do justice to the remarkable experience. And, and I think part of it is because the, this word that keeps coming back to me, and really I learned it, um, I, I should say, I started to learn it in Peru, and that word is surrender. Surrender is it. Right? And being able to surrender to everything that's happening. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and so hard for them. Yeah. So hard for most people from the West. Me included, yeah. right? I mean, it, it is because it it means, you know, one of the things it means is not feeling in control, right? Being able to let go. And, and you know, we've talked about this before. <coughs> Surrender isn't a, a passive word. It's right. a very active process. So active. And so there is control in it, mm -hmm. but it feels like you're letting go, and so you're out of control. Exactly. Uh, let, you know what? Let's talk about this for a little bit. Because it's, it's really, really important in life. Surrender is, is one of the greatest acts of faith. It puts us face to face with fear, puts us face to face with our limitations. It puts us face to face with our preconceived habit patterns. And it says, can, can you let go or can you let God take control? Let the universe evolve you into something that is beyond who you are. And I always think about the process of like a, a plant blossoming, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That little seed that pops through the ground and it's like, I'm supposed to become a tree. I don't know how I'm going to get there. Now you might have the end destination in mind, but everything that leads to that place is out of our control. But the faith, it allows us to surrender to the process of us becoming. You know, I, I'm going to apologize to anybody who's heard this story before, but I've, I've got to tell this because it comes to mind as I'm listening yeah. to you. There's a book by Richard Bach who mm -hmm. wrote, among other things, Jonathan Livingston Seagull. And, yeah, yeah. Okay, this so, one is so good. This one is uh, uh, The Reluctant Messiah. Okay. okay. And he tells this story in here, and I actually don't remember the context, but it doesn't really matter. And the story is this, this little river creature, right? There's a whole bunch of these river creatures holding on to the moss of this rock, cold river running over them, and, and they'll reach out every once in a while if some food comes by and try and grab it, right? 
I don't know, for some reason in my mind, these are like <laughs> sea monkeys. I don't entirely know what sea monkeys look like, but that's what it <laughs> reminds me of. Anyway, this one says, I don't like it here. I'm going to let go. And all of his friends are like, no, no, you can't let go. You don't know what's going to happen. And right. he says, but I know I don't love it here, Whew. so I'll let go. That To me, that's surrender. That's, that's really it. Right? And faith, you know, b- being able to let yeah. go and, and say, it's going to be okay. Yeah. No matter what happens, it's going to be okay. Yeah. Man. That, and that can be hard sometimes to yeah. navigate because if you've never known something new, it's easy to hold on to the old because as humans, we like predictability. It's easy when we know what is expected. It's a lot harder to let it ourselves flow downstream. But I feel like what is so powerful about the human expression is we have this little intuitive voice inside that does know. The more we get quiet, it does know. In Stephen Pressfield's book, The War of Art, he calls them the diamonds, yeah. like this intuitive wisp of inspiration that constantly calls us. And in Paulo Coelho's book, The Alchemist, he speaks of it like this voice continues to come, and the more we don't listen to it, the quieter it becomes. But as soon as we do listen to it, it allows us to not only begin to al- alchemize ourselves into our highest expression, our truest self, but to tap into what he calls the soul of the world and begin to really partake in the divine manuscript rather than our limited human self-imposed limitations. So I've got two things to, to tell you, and they're both remarkable and unremarkable at the same time. <laughs> they're, they're remarkable because of the coincidence that I'm going to share, and they're uh-huh. unremarkable because there are no coincidences. Exactly. Right? <laughs> You've said, I think, three times in this conversation about the alchemist and so forth. Yeah. This morning, as I was doing my meditation, my North Star, which I'm going to talk about yours in a little bit, my North Star came to me, and I wrote down, I am an alchemist of human potential. Come on, man. That's a bar right there. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy when you start spinning in these circles, yeah. right? How yeah. it just comes to you. So maybe somebody was whispering to me this morning. Alchemy is a powerful, powerful it word. Is. And it became more powerful once I learned about the first phase of alchemy. Which is? Which they call the negredo. Yeah. The negredo is the blackening, the deep, dark decomposition beneath the soil that potentializes the seed. And that inevitably allowed me to step further into the surrender, that when it's dark, when it's wet, when everything is going wrong, that's the most important part. That takes the most courage. It's easy to be courageous once you come out into the sunlight, but being in the, you know, metaphorical cave of Plato and allowing yourself to like, figure out what is down there and allow that to grow you, that's the courage. It's, you know, it's interesting because the, as you said, we hold on to things, Mm -hmm. right? I used to think that we would seek a comfort zone, and I I still think that's true, but Mm -hmm. what I think of as a comfort zone is different. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, it it isn't necessarily where you're comfortable. Sometimes it is, Mm -hmm. but sometimes it's where it's familiar. Mm -hmm. And in those situations that are familiar, they're not necessarily good situations. Right. But you find comfort in the familiarity. Yeah. Right. And so being able to let go of that, being able to surrender. It's weird to think that letting go gives you control, and yet that's exactly what happens. <laughs> that's the right? paradox, right? Yeah. The greatest paradox. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it, it's in that. Um, you bringing that up, my therapist, he shared a quote with me. He said, if it's familiar, even if it's unhealthy, it'll be comfortable. Yeah. If it's unfamiliar, even if it is healthy, it will be uncomfortable. Right. And I always think about that. I'm like... This is familiar, but is this healthy? And you know what? I think this was our first in-person conversation we had. At one point, I said, you, you had asked about uh, working with me on your PhD. And yeah. I said, no, you've got things to do. <laughs> you did. You've got to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah. And, and this would be comfortable. You need to go to be uncomfortable. Yeah. And you started the warrior retreat and you, yeah. I mean, you did all these amazing so things that we get to talk yeah. about uh, going forward. But yeah, it's, I think surrender is, is underrated mm-hmm. and it's an act of courage mm-hmm. that you have with surrender, I think is, is, I mean, and that then courage, mm-hmm. I'm going to use one of your phrases, you're, you've said this several times about several things before. It's like a muscle. Courage is like a muscle, mm-hmm. right? Yep. The more you use it, 
the yeah. stronger it gets. You come, you develop that brave heart, right? In essence, right. yeah. Another book that is incredible about surrender is by Michael Singer called The Surrender Experiment. Oh yeah, and yeah. that book is, if you want to learn how surrender works firsthand, just that book is surrender after surrender after surrender. I remember, I don't know where the, I came across this book, but I remember sitting on an airplane and don't know where I was going, like I don't know where I was flying, right. don't remember how right. long the flight was, I just remember the book. And I'm like, oh my goodness, this is so cool. And this guy's just writing about what's going on in his life. And, but it didn't seem like it was about him, <clears throat> right? I mean, it was, it's a really cool book, I agree with you. That's the beauty of when we lean into our dharma, mm -hmm. when we lean into our truth, when we let go like those little sea monkeys and allow ourselves to float down the stream, everybody becomes better because of it. It's like in that sea monkey letting go, he inspired some other sea monkeys too. Right. And I guarantee some of those sea monkeys later on in the story, maybe in the sequel, they let go as well. And that's the powerful thing. Not only that, imagine that sea monkey who he's going to meet downstream. And he's going to be able to tell the story about how he was once stuck to a rock and he right. decided to go surf in the waves. Yeah. And that, and you're right. That becomes the power of the ripple effect. Exactly. You remember this study that was done uh, several years ago? Uh, four, I think it was four monkeys in a, in a room. And in the room, there was a pole. And at the top of the pole, there were bananas. And, and one of the monkeys, of course, started to climb up the pole and to get a banana. And when it got near the banana it would get a squirt of water and fall off the pole, right? And so eventually, as a monkey would try to climb up, the other monkeys would pull it down. Yeah. And so uh, then they took one of the monkeys out and replaced it with a new monkey. And uh, of course, that monkey would start to climb up and they, the other monkeys would pull it down. Anyway, long story short, eventually, there were all monkeys that had never experienced the water. And when one of them would try to climb up, the others would pull it down, mm. right? And so it's almost like that sea monkey story, but the other ones are saying, no, you can't let go and we're gonna hold you yeah. here, right? And, and I think sometimes we're in these environments mm -hmm. where people are pulling us down mm -hmm. and we don't even know why, yeah. right? Yeah. The people pulling you down don't know why and the person or monkey <laughs> getting pulled right. down doesn't know right. why. It's just everybody's pulling them down. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I really fell in love with the allegory of the cave mm -hmm. by Plato mm -hmm. and that concept of being, <clears throat> being in a metaphorical cave, you know, especially coming from where I come from, you know, there's a crab in the bucket type mentality. Yeah. But being in the metaphorical cave of Plato and your whole life, you see a certain thing and you're inundated with a certain dogma and you have a particular worldview and then all of a sudden it only takes one little stimulus and all of a sudden one person sees something a little different. The biggest leap of faith is that moment where you can choose to remain the same or you can choose to step into the light. And I believe we are at a point in society right now where we're all being asked to step out of those metaphorical caves, to step out of our preconceived notions of how things are supposed to go, to step out of the conditioning, to break, break our family trajectories and change the, the routes of where we're supposed to go, to like step into our highest expression. And all of it inevitably comes back to surrendering, mm -hmm. courage, faith, and letting go and taking that leap. And there's a, a quote that I love. It goes, uh, the girl goes, but what if I fall? And then like great spirits like, oh, darling, but what if you fly? Right. That's, the, therein lies the reward. Yeah. Can you take the leap and risk it all to inevitably fly? Well, and this brings us to the next point, yeah. which is, you know, we talked about what you're doing now, which in and of itself, is remarkable. It's not even close to all of the things that you're doing, but mm -hmm. you gave a summary. But at one point, you were in a place where you had to make a decision. Yes. Right. So let's talk about that. Let's take us take us for the origin of the hero's journey. All right. So shout out to Las Vegas because it's been my training ground. 
I call it the neon dojo. And as we were speaking about earlier, what I love about Vegas is no matter where I go in the world, everybody has a visceral reaction to Vegas. Mm -hmm. It's never just like blase, like, oh, cool, you're from Pahrump. <laughs> you know, it's like either whoa or mm, or I can only do Vegas for a weekend. But growing up here, you, you get all of it. it. You're immersed in the full swirl of what Vegas can be. And when you grow up poor and in the projects of Vegas, I feel like that is even more amplified because the juxtaposition of wealth and money and shiny things that you always see at the strip that is always taunting you of what could be, it, the unchecked human or the unregulated human can lose themselves in a swirl of vices really, really quick. So growing up at a young age in the projects with a single mom, I was faced with a lot of challenges from an early age, a lot of gang violence, a lot of drug and substance abuse, a lot of mental health issues. And my mom did a great job at trying to protect me from that with this limited tool set she had. But being a single parent, working at Walmart, barely making it, dealing with her own mental challenges because of her challenging upbringing, by the time I was 16 years old, although I was a phenomenal athlete but could never afford to play sports because my family didn't have enough money, by the time I was 16 years old, I ended up dropping out of high school and living on the streets from 16 to 18, just fully lost in a swirl of destructive habits like alcohol and, I mean, and not just a little bit of alcohol. We would go to the local supermarket and we would fill up carts of alcohol and go out the emergency exit just to like satiate our drinking. Yeah. So that was like two years. And at that time, a lot of my friends were going three places, which is dead, being in the cemetery, jail, or getting stuck in some situation that is just like, you can't get out of. As I, we're talking about earlier, like sometimes it just takes one wrong move. Right. And so 18 years old, I find myself at a bus stop in front of Sam's Town on Boulder Highway. And that was the moment I had an aha. I always felt there was something special in me. And my mom always emphasized there was something special in me. One of the greatest gifts my mom told me was that she doesn't care what anybody says to me. If anybody has a problem with me, they have to talk to my mom. Mm -hmm. And so she let me know that she believed in me. And that was a gift. And the farther I've walked on my path, the more that gift has become super, super important for me to choose me and to me have faith, even if the world around me tells me like, no, like you can't do anymore. So I'm sitting at the bus stop and I decide that I'm going to, if I'm going to die on the streets, I'm going to at least try to get out. I'm going to try to reroute all my energy and do something with my life. And as soon as I made that choice, and this is so important for people who are on the path, a choice point can change everything. As soon as I made that choice, six months later, I got into this program called Job Corps. Job Corps is in Sierra Nevada, right outside of Reno. Last opportunity, vocational government training. It's on a militant military schedule. I went up there, lived like a cadet every morning, 6 a.m., make your bed. Started instituting more discipline into my mm -hmm. life. And in six months, I got my high school diploma, which I never thought I could receive. And I got a college credit. I got a C minus in college. And I was like, oh, Maybe I'm not as dumb as they told me I was. And that really was the beginning. That was the beginning of me believing in myself. I came back to Vegas after that and began the journey of being a student, slowly re-educating myself. It took me three years. And you, you, all, you all will see it through my transcripts. It took me three years of doing remedial classes before I even got a college credit. So I was in college almost three years before any of my credits counted because I was so far behind. Yeah. It's like English five or something like that. But the momentum began, and we call it Big Mo in, in sports. Big Mo woke up, and that momentum began to take my life into a completely different direction. I always say it took 10 years from the, the moment I decided to change everything to get to baseline. 10 years of hustling, 10 years of belief, 10 years of faith, 10 years of cutting out my friends, 10 years of floating downstream, not knowing exactly where I'm gonna land to get to that next sea monkey colony where there, there's more sea monkeys that have let go of the rock. But the, your tribe of sea monkeys. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly, exactly. The tribe. That's, that's the new uh, phrase of, 
for the crew. That's right. The, the tribe monkey of crew. sea monkeys. <laughs> so, you know, it's uh, so along the way, I want to add this. It wasn't that you were passive. Right. Right. I mean, you're reading, you're a voracious reader now, but mm -hmm. you, you really started it back then. Yeah. You know, yeah. a thousand books. A thousand right? plus books in like yeah. the course of like 15 plus years. Yeah. Everything yeah. and anything I get my hand on because the books were my way to time travel and leave the projects because at that time I never even left the state, let alone I only had been to Summerlin one time. I was on the other side of Vegas. That's And you hear about these stories of kids growing up in the project right. and never leaving their respective blocks. But through books, which my mother taught me to read at a very young age, through books I was able to start to time travel and start to self-reflect and start to abstractly think. And in that space of me choosing to be better, people saw that. And sometimes, you know, of course, transformation is hard. But when we see somebody who is genuinely trying to be a better person, people want to help that. Mm -hmm. And they saw that in me. And people started to really gather around me to help me on my path. And so I couldn't have done it alone, even though sometimes it feels like it's a, a lonely process. I feel like once that sea monkey let go, I feel like there was like other fish that were guiding it. There were yeah. people on the outside or, or things on the outside showing it which direction to go. And that's the power of like mentors and, and books and, and things like that. I, so uh, it, this is an important point to me because, you know, there are people, like you've said this before, we've talked about it several times. There are people that you grew up with mm -hmm that didn't get out of that, yeah. that environment, yeah. right? They stayed in that environment. There's a difference in, there's some difference in you because you moved in another direction. I know your mom is a, is a huge influence mm -hmm. as far as that's concerned. Mm -hmm. um, we're gonna talk later about your mentors and I know that she was right yeah. up there at the top. Yep. Um, but, the, but at some point, you chose to pull yourself up. Now granted, your mom gave you some of the resources to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. I think one of the most important is to know that at a very fundamental level, somebody has your back. Yeah, right. absolutely. And so that that degree of safety, even though your world wasn't safe, your your home was safe. Right, right. right. Um, that allowed you to take some of these chances, but you still had to take the chances, mm -hmm. right? You yeah. still had to take that college class. You, you could have revolted against any of it. I mean, you're clever enough. You could have escaped from the job corps, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, but you didn't, right? right. You, and, and I think that that is something that becomes really important, mm -hmm. that there is, a, there is a choice, and you walk through one door, right? And that door helped you go to the next door and the next door. And yeah, you had people that helped you along the way, mm -hmm. But ultimately, you're the one who did the work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, I, and I say that because I think it's important for you to honor yourself in that. Thank you. But I also think it's important for other people who are out there to honor themselves Absolutely. for doing that as well. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Yeah, it's so important. It's, uh, it's, it's the journey in the Bhagavad Gita. They say yoga is the journey of the self to the self through the self. And that's really what the journey is. It's inevitably us getting to know a deeper level of ourselves through the journey and continuing to choose to open up those metaphorical doors of knowing thyself right again and again and again mm -hmm. and i feel like it's a video game you know for our the 90s and 80s kids out there who played mario brothers and all that we get better at playing this game called life but unlike a video game sometimes those those drop offs those tunnels those they can be the game's over and right. it's completely over. That's why life is so sacred and we have to move with precision as I'm learning rather than frivolously. Got to really take it serious. I, I think the, the analogy that comes to mind as you're describing that is, is all of us walk a ledge, right? Oh, always. And, and in your case, and, and to some extent my case as well, for, for some of us, the ledge is really narrow. Yeah. And so you misstep a little bit, <laughs> yeah. and, and that's it. <laughs> right? so for some people, it's a huge ledge, yeah, right? Exactly. It's, a, it's a street. Exactly. And so it's hard for you to misstep. <laughs> You're going to have to wander way off to the center. <laughs> right, right. But, but I do think that we all have that. Yeah. Right? We do all have that ledge. And, yeah. and in your case... Like you've you've said, you know, it's a, it was a narrow ledge that Na you were. It on. was a narrow ledge. It feels good to have like more of a street now. Yeah, 
Yeah, well, you, you know, and so this goes back to the idea, you know, some you had people on the sides of the ledge saying, no, 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 let's <laughs> let's let's push you back to the center. Right, right. And then you chose to go there. Yeah, right. Exactly. Which I think is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's one of the things that's really interesting to me is that that and, you know, I've known for a while that you you, you know, are sort of a phoenix, right? You continue to rise from the ashes, mm-hmm. this idea of adversity that you not only deal with, you actually seek mm-hmm. um, so that you can improve. It, I don't know why this never occurred to me before, but that foundation that your mom gave, mm-hmm. and, and just really briefly, if you want to tell a story about the, when your mom uh, took care of the teacher, um, that foundation of security mm-hmm. was the springboard for everything else. Can you tell the, I mean, this is my opinion, so let yeah, me know yeah. if you don't agree, but tell the story. I love it. Yeah. I, can you remind me of which yeah, one yeah. exactly? Teacher was, uh, basically the teacher was telling you how, you know, you're a problem, you, you know, you're not smart, you're these kinds of things. And your mom said, next time your teacher tells you, you don't yeah. have to listen to her. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So my mom, she had one rule for me. It was like when I was starting school, she like sat me down. She was like, it wasn't a rule of be good in class. It wasn't a rule of respect your elders. The rule was if anybody has a problem with you, tell them that they have to talk to your mom. So she unleashed a a, a vigilante upon the Clark County School District in uh, the little guy that I was. And she, uh, I had a lot of teachers that had a huge challenge with me because I was spastic in a lot of ways. I was out there. They ended up finding like I was a gate student. So obviously my brain was a little... uh, different but gifted and talented gift, yeah gifted right. yeah and neuro, uh, neurodivergent a little bit and um many many teachers came to me and told me that they didn't like how I was acting I needed to be a certain way and many many times I looked at teachers in the eyes and said I'm sorry I don't have to listen to you if you have a problem you have to talk to my mom yeah and that was like <laughs> that was I was the bane of their existence at that time but that right there freed me to be me and that has always lasted, like, throughout my my journey, even to this day. Like, I feel like my mother's voice is in the back of my head. And if anybody has a problem with me, I'm just like, yo, you got to talk to my mom. <laughs> like, sorry. Yeah. yeah. I, I absolutely love it. Yeah. And, and that is the priceless gift that keeps on giving. Exactly. Exactly. I uh, know you, when you tell the story, you actually mentioned your one of your teacher's names. Mine was Miss Janicek, by the way. Come on. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Same situation or similar situation, I should say. But um, yeah, I mean, it's really interesting how people, I, I guess it still happens, but certainly back then, mm-hmm. if you didn't fit into a, a box, 100%. Something was wrong with you. 100%. Right? Not the box. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they tried to medicate me many times, and my mom wouldn't let them medicate me, which was, you know, shout out to her because yeah. so many parents in this day and age, they're. Medication is the first thing rather than like looking at the the environment and saying, is this environment conducive to a creative child? I, I think I heard a statistic recently that they said that the fundamental K through 12 education system hasn't changed in like 100 plus years. Yeah. I mean, it's a it's an industrial system. Exactly. Yeah. So luckily, my mom gave me the <laughs> the, the tools to like not become a byproduct of it completely, which is why I dropped out of high school. And at that time, society really shunned me for being a high school dropout. I mean, when we think of high school dropouts, we oftentimes, like, like we look down upon them. Right. But she gave me that, that belief in myself to be a high school dropout and to do something different. And all these years later, it's now 20 years since I graduated high school from Job Corps, I'm so happy that I took an alternative route. The thing, you know, this will be a theme coming through, but, you know, we've known each other for quite a quite a number mm-hmm. of years and and one of the things that I think is remarkable about you is your ability to look at uh, what I would call adversity as an opportunity mm-hmm. and rising above and I uh, you know I don't know why this never occurred to me before but essentially that gift of you know that you're protected mm-hmm. right yeah uh, you know you have the support 
I think that it's got to be helpful, incredibly helpful mm -hmm. in saying, I'm going to be okay. Yeah. I just, I, now let's see what I can get out of this adverse situation, right? Absolutely. Um, we'll talk about this later if you're interested, but challenge point, right? Yeah, I would love to. And the idea that if we have an optimal challenge, we have optimal growth. Always. Right. And, and that makes sense, but almost nobody really embraces it but you do you i do really yes do. yeah i do because I've, I've seen i've seen what it can can do and that's therein lies the the desire is to to see what my limit is and i haven't found the limit yet every time i lean into a challenge i grow i expand i think one of the reasons why i fell in love with fitness at such a young age third grade miss bennett had this program called Jaws, Jog and Walk Stars. And they were like, all right, kids, you could either play on the playground or every day at lunch, you could run laps. And every time you run a lap, which was a quarter mile, you get a stamp. And if you run 100 miles by the end of the year, you'll get a pizza party. It was me and one other kid that got the pizza party. But she said, she said, if you run fast enough, you're gonna meet this thing called the wall. And the wall is this burn that's gonna come into your side. But if you can hold on long enough, there's something magical on the other wow. side of the wall on the yeah. burn. And so I started to seek out the wall, the wall inside myself. And I started to commune with that burn. And I realized that there's always something on the other side of the mm -hmm. wall. And so as I leaned into these challenges in my life, I constantly am seeking out the wall. And I've yet to find a wall that stops me. Every time the wall grows me, it's like stepping into this magical cave where there's certain gems and power-ups it's a video game and on the other side of it is a new level and so i'm constantly seeking out that wall that i was that was instilled in me in third grade that's it's fascinating you know it reminds me of uh and if you don't mind telling the story of the the steps in peru where <laughs> yeah. you learned all in on all in all in on all in yeah so yeah all in on all in so cusco peru is twelve thousand feet altitude Everybody that goes there, they have to, even the best athletes have to sit down for like three days and adapt. And the people in Peru are even shorter because there's less oxygen, the Quechua people. And there's these set of stairs in the favelas that lead from Plaza de Armas, the, the center part of Peru, this beautiful square, up to the mountains around it. These stairs run about a mile up. And going down there, I started to train on them. First time I did it, one time up, absolutely crushed me. And that became my, my marker. Mm -hmm. So eventually, after a few years of going to Peru, every time I go down to hit these stairs, I realized like the magic number is five an hour. But that was like beyond anything I could imagine. And so I decided that I was gonna hit five an hour. I went out one day, got through the first four. I got to the top, I'm shaking. There's vomit like coming up out of my throat almost. I taste blood in my mouth, um, my head spinning, and I quit. I said, you know what? There's no reward here for being completely annihilated. There's no gold medals. There's no Instagram likes or anything like that. I'm done. And I went back to, to my house that night, and I just started to think about where I was in life. And I realized that although I had pushed myself so far and come so far that there was a fifth stair that always appeared within my challenges. And that fifth stair I never wanted to take because it opened up the portal of suffering. And I think one of human beings least desired spaces <clears throat> is to suffer for no reason whatsoever. There's already enough suffering. Who wants mm -hmm. to like in, inflict more suffering on themselves? And so the fifth stair in my life represented this pain point that was hyper confronting and that would could annihilate me in the process. Not only could annihilate me, but that fifth stare felt like I could die going into that space. And so the next day I went out and I said, you know what, let's see. Let's see if, if this is right. what it's gonna be. And I hit those four stairs and the fifth came up and I felt absolutely horrible and I chose to go for it and it was one of those moments where I'm going up them stairs and you've been there with me and tears just started coming out of my eyes mm -hmm. because I accessed a new part of me and I finished that fifth set of stairs 
absolutely annihilated at 12,000 feet altitude. And I understood that there was a whole new level that I could access. And so this is why I look to the greats, the Kobe Bryants, the Muhammad Ali's, the Bruce Lee famously saying he was out there running his three mile run. And one of his buddies was like, I think I'm gonna die. And Bruce Lee said, die then. This is why I look to these guys because what they found is that through the pain, through the suffering, there's freedom. And that's what I've actively the last four or five years been leaning into is where is the fifth stair in all aspects of my life, in my own psychology, in my own physical capacity, in my relationships, in my finances, there's fifth stairs everywhere. And none of them, what's cool about the stairs, nobody can climb it for you. And that fifth stair, if you're really going for that under an hour mark, it's gonna hurt. But I've learned to embrace the hurt and just get really okay with embracing the suck, knowing that on the other side of the suck, there's something powerful and purposeful. Yeah, it's a, and those stairs, by the way, are no joke. No yeah. joke. <laughs> <laughs> but, and, and I think even, I, I think one of the things that's really important to, for me that I feel to say right now is the fifth stair doesn't have to be extreme. It right? doesn't. It just has to be our next fifth stair, right? Yep. I mean, there are people who go into the gym is their fifth stair, yeah. like getting in the car or walking or however you do it, getting yep. to the gym and working out. That's their fifth stair. Yep. And, and I think that that becomes important. And our fifth stair changes. It does. As we change. It does. Right? And, I, and, and so whatever it is. And, and then, you know, the, the, what was ringing in my head as you're talking about this is your choice when you s took that first step on the fifth set, right? <laughs> that first step, you had a choice between the pain of walking up the stairs or the pain of regret. And you chose the pain of walking up the stairs, which gave you a lifetime of something positive, right? That's it. And if you chose the pain of regret, it would give you a lifetime of something negative. That's it. Okay, so let's, let's start there. Mm -hmm. We've all had regret. Mm -hmm. You know, your, your mission is love, right? Love is my mission. Yeah. The other side of love, I think, and I, I don't know that these are in direct contrast, but the other side is regret. Mm, that's powerful. And so talk to me a little bit about that. What regrets have you had? What regrets have you avoided because you had love? That's a deep question. Thank you for going there. Um, welcome. When I, when I think of regrets, to, to, be, to be truthful, I've done a lot of excavation. So any regrets that I have had, they actually have, have been turned into mm -hmm. teachings. Mm -hmm. So I'm grateful for them. Every one of them. You know, in positive psychology, we talk about post-traumatic growth. And one of my favorite books is uh, Viktor Frankl's Man's yeah. Search for Meaning. One, maybe one of the greatest books ever. Inc written. Incredible. Yeah. What a from a research standpoint, from a humanity standpoint. So when it comes to regrets, I don't have any anymore. Be and what's cool too is I've had some of my biggest regrets, like one of my biggest regrets was like my one of my past partners, uh, shout out to Alex. Like she left me for another guy and I was completely heartbroken and I was like, man, I should have been a better man. I was just like, so beating myself up. But that inevitably became the portal for me to check my ego, tap back into my heart and become a better man. And so I think a lot of people, when they have regrets, if they look a little deeper, it's actually the greatest lesson plan that they could ever lean into. It might be painful. It's going to be definitely confronting. <laughs> might take a psychotherapists and a couple teams to dissect and excavate it, but inevitably there's gifts on the other side of it. And so I continue to lean into these, those spaces as like lessons. And I think that's the key to becoming a holistic human mm -hmm. is excavate the regrets and know that there's nobody perfect on earth. And it's actually our stories, our challenges, our hardships that actually 
become our testimony. Those become what make us us if we don't let them completely destroy us. And on the flip side of that, we see people who are in their life and they cannot stop ruminating for the right. past. They're stuck in the past and therefore their story continues to be one of victimization. They familiarize themselves with an identity that revolves around what happened to them rather than allowing that to be a catalyst for their potential. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. You know, I mean, we know this from science. People who spend too much time in the past or the future tend to be unhappy. <laughs> yeah, right. I believe it. You know, this. I'm glad you brought up this story about Alex because I remember walking down a, a Rainbow Mountain, fourteen thousand <laughs> feet, right, having this conversation, and you were in pain. Oh, I was about in pain. This. And and yet you had joy about it yeah. too. It yeah. was crazy, and I'm like, holy crap, this guy is enjoying the pain because because I think you knew what was on the other side, and one of the one of the greatest gifts that we have that you and I share is. No matter what happens in our life, we can use that to help other people. That's it. And hopefully including ourselves, right? That's it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I know I've never told you that, but I, I was just, I was sort of having an out-of-body experience thinking, you know, almost observing this conversation from outside, thinking, <laughs> this guy's in so much pain and he's so happy about it, you know, because you knew what was on the other side. I remember that moment like it was yesterday. Yeah. Like Rainbow Mountain. For, for the listeners, is unreal. 17,000 feet above sea level, the most beautiful, majestic Andes Mountains you can mm -hmm. ever see. And me and Dr. G are walking down, just like in the moment. And the breath there, right? Yeah. <laughs> like every step you have every to breathe step. because yeah. you have to be present. You can't live in the future past there. You have to be present. Well, that's a ledge. Talk <laughs> about ledges. Ledge. Yeah, yeah. That is a ledge. Yeah. yeah. But that was one of the biggest teachings of my life. I was going through that process. And, you know, I was able to reconnect with her recently. And she's one of my dearest friends. Yeah. Like greatest teachers. And it's those it's those things that if we look and we excavate, that's the key word. One of the key words of this year that I've been leaning into. When we excavate, we inevitably find priceless gems. And so I'm leaning, I'm telling all of my, my students and my, my friends, like, go into that place, go into the cave, because there's, there's something for you there that nobody else can go. And if you go there, you're going to pull out something that not only changes your life, but can change others' lives. Yeah. And, it, you know, I think the thing about it to add to that, and by the way, just real quick, I think it's beautiful the way you describe things like that, that gem that you found, right? Yeah. I think to add to that, if if I were to say, hey, Brandon, I know this is going to suck for a certain amount of time. It's going to suck for two and a half months. And then these are all the gems that you're going to get out of it. Will you accept this? You would say, yeah, of course. But we don't know that about adversity. And we don't know it because we're we're part of it, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and what I mean is whether or not it takes two and a half months and what we get out of it, that's up to us. Exactly. You know? And yet, if you think about, for both of us, for most people, mm -hmm. the, the greatest growth and the greatest lessons we've ever had in life come from the hard times, right? From the Always. adversity. Always. And, and, and again, to honor yourself about this because you made the choice. Yeah, yeah. Right? I, I always say when people speak to me of failure, I say, congratulations. Yeah. You earned it. Yeah. They're like, what do, you, what do you mean I earned it? You put yourself in a situation to step into the cave, to step into the dojo, to step into a master class, and you're going to be changed forever because of it. Yeah. But if you choose to stay in your heart and stay in love, it's going to open up something beyond your wildest imagination. It's funny. I just had this conversation today. Somebody was telling me how hard their workout was. And and I said, oh, good for you. And they're like, what? <laughs> yeah. But yeah. that's exactly right. And and, and to, I, I will also say, you know, we just talked about challenge point a minute ago. I will also say extremes aren't necessarily a good thing, right? Mm -hmm. it, it has to be your fifth flight of that's stairs. That's it. That's right? the key. Yeah. There is an optimal state, yep. but it has to be your optimal state. Or you go too far, too quick, right. too soon, and... <clears throat> that's equivalent of the caterpillar coming out of the 
the butterfly coming out of the cocoon so mm -hmm. too soon. Mm -hmm. We were just speaking about this in Nike, uh, about this idea that the essence of a good trainer once upon a time was being able to kill the students or kill your in your class like by doing a thousand burpees. Any trainer can go into a room and have people do a thousand burpees and redline everybody. The art of a great trainer is to be able to get everybody to their own edge. Right. That's to their the challenge point. Their challenge right. point. And right. that's the thing. The problem with this day and age of Instagram and social media is we're competing against other people's edges. And therefore, if you go against somebody else's edge and you are not prepared, you're going to think that you failed. But the true failure is not that. It's that you went, you compared yourself to some another person's saga. And so it's so important for us to stay in our own story, stay in our own capacity, stay in our own journey. And knowing thyself, we get better and better at figuring out this is my edge. Right. And sometimes a person's edge might actually be soft. It could be my edge is more rest. My edge is more nourishment right now. My edge is taking care of myself more. And sometimes the edge is extreme. And I think there's seasons. We bounce back and forth in between edges. But it's important to be aware on the journey that the only person you're competing against is yourself. It's a, it's a great point. I mean, we, uh, we teach this thing called the elite performer cycle, mm -hmm. right? And it's made up of train, compete, recover. And most people forget the recover, right? And, <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. Um, and so you need to have whatever your edge is. This is kind of a stupid analogy, but it came to me while you were talking. <laughs> it's kind of like, um, you know, putting on a pair of pants, right? If you if I put on my pants, they may fit me, but if I put on your pants, they may not fit. It's not there's nothing wrong with the pants. <laughs> it's a good right? analogy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's I know it's kind of goofy. They might whatever. be like the Jenko jeans. You remember those? Yeah. <laughs> I hear <laughs> they're right. coming back. That's right. Uh, that's right. Some uh, hammer pants. Yeah. Uh, but okay, so it's yeah, it's really interesting. This whole thing is really interesting to me about kind of two parts of this, right? You have to know your edge and then I have to go to your to your edge. Mm -hmm. You have to have a mindset that allows you to accept the challenge. Exactly. And then and then, then I think the <clears throat> generativity around this to be able to to contribute to other people because of the things that you've learned and the struggles that you've had. Yeah. Which I think you do a phenomenal job of this. Um, I think that that becomes so important because and this you know, this gets back to you mentioned Viktor Frankl's book. He found, you know, that if he could figure out a way to contribute to other people, it was going to be great, right? That's what we're talking about. Yeah. And, yep. and ultimately it comes down to the, your, what value do you have mm -hmm. to give to other people? Absolutely. I think it's so powerful what Viktor Frankl did because there was no guarantee he was going to get out of those concentration camps. I mean, the, the probability <laughs> if you're rolling the dice, <laughs> it wasn't it's going to come up craps a lot. And he's sitting there doing a research to yeah. help humanity right. when there's a pretty good chance he's not getting out. Yeah, That's fascinating, yeah. but powerful, and which is why what he created is a work of art that can never be replicated. But Hopefully, yeah. right? But And you think... On the one hand, it sounds crazy. On the other hand, it gave him purpose. Exactly. And purpose, I feel, that's purpose is the golden thread. Right, right. In the challenge. Yeah. It's, yeah, I mean, living on purpose. Yeah. Right? It changes your life. It does. Being able to find that, what it, it is. In yoga, we call it sankalpa. Sankalpa is like your beautiful declaration or your divine dharma. Like the Dharma, one of my master teachers, she always says, protect the Dharma and the Dharma will protect you. Protect the intention, protect the purpose, and that golden thread is the lifeline that pulls you from point A to point Z, even in the dark. Yeah. It's, you know, it's interesting. The, this word Dharma is important, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's kind of a, you know, I talk a lot about finding your North Star mm -hmm. and about how important your personal values are. I mean, we, you know, we, we have a, had a friend in common, Tony Shea, who mm. was so very values driven at one point in his life. And so those two things, your North Star and your values are so important. And yet, uh, Sankalpa puts those together. Yeah. They're not two different things. They're the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. To honor the Sankalpa. Right. 
because there's a lot of guys we know, girls we know, women we know, um, men we know that are successful, that societally they've achieved certain levels of success, but without values, it becomes empty and it becomes uh, destructive. Mm -hmm. With values, it becomes powerful and concentrated. And one of the words that I, I love that I speak with our brother James Silvis about a lot is precision. Precision is when our values and our intentions align. It's like a laser. When they're not alignment, the laser is everywhere. And as we know, a spread out laser is not powerful. But when we fine tune our energy and we bring it all together, that's when it becomes really, really potent. Yeah, I love the analogy because it's almost it's almost like there are two lenses, right? Exactly. And and if That's one's uh, focused and the other isn't, it doesn't do you much good. Exactly. You have to focus exactly. on both. Yeah. Right? To harness it, and that requires for us to be clean. This is why I love the origin of yoga. Um, it speaks of yoking. Yoking is to remove all the toxins. Tapas, one of the uh, niyamas, means like to burn away so that anything that is not us is gone and everything that is us is in alignment and alignment inevitably allows for our energy to be come harnessed in a certain direction and when it's harnessed in a certain direction that's when it becomes powerful so uh, it reminds me of a story that i heard there about when people would mine gold mm. you know it wasn't like they'd just pull out a big chunk of gold it was gold that was you know had rock or is rock and so forth and they would take that and they'd put it over heat and the heat would melt the gold. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, and it's it's just like what you're saying. You have to have, you have to put it under heat. You have to put it under heat. Right. To get the gold out. Yeah. I think the heat mixed with the intention, mixed with the focus, with the values. Right. That's like the perfect alchemy. Yeah. Right there. And alchemy then coming up again. Time, and then add time as yeah. a construct. Right. And not personal time, but Francis Weller speaks of this thing called geological time. And I love geological time because geological time, they say, moves much slower. Mm -hmm. Human time, we want it now. Everything's speeding up. Geological time happens at its own time. And I think oftentimes, because you get a lot of people that want change now. They want transformation now. They want their next level now. In nature, it happens when it's supposed to happen. Right. We just got to create the right environment for that to happen. And when values are in alignment and integrity is in alignment, and our intention is in alignment, and the fire is there, the cooking happens, and inevitably gold is created. Yeah, yeah, both lenses yeah. are focused. Yeah, that's a, that's a book. It's <laughs> both lenses. So, you know, it, this, it's interesting to me because we're talking about it in kind of a philosophical way, mm -hmm. right? But there's really cool science behind this. So much science. I mean, you think about, for example, we think about the fist stairs, yeah. right? If you go too far, mm -hmm. your brain's, well, let me start this way. Your brain's job is to protect you, job number one, yep. to protect you. So if you go too far and it hurts too bad, whatever that means, mm -hmm. too bad, right? Your brain is going to help you avoid being in that situation as much as it possibly can. Right. Right. And so if you sort of sneak up on the fifth stairs in a way that you, you evolve to the fifth stair. Mm -hmm. Like, so for example, in that case, you were already training, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And you would train for those things. If you would have done it, you know, with no training and you were mm -hmm. uh, out of shape and your cardiovascular system wasn't good, then it would have been a real problem, Yeah. right? And your brain would do what it could to protect you and it would shut everything down. Yeah, exactly. But you were ready to receive that challenge. Mm -hmm. And I think that, it's really fascinating. So many times we go too far mm -hmm. and with the idea that if a little is good, a lot's better. Right. And then our brain and our body, you know, recoil from this mm -hmm. to protect us. Yep. Yep. And it's not just in physical things. It's in relationships. It's emotional. It's intellectual. It's, it's social. It's mm -hmm. any of these kinds of things. And, and it goes, this goes back to the idea that we have to find this, uh, sweet spot, this mm -hmm. optimal challenge point, which changes as we change. Mm -hmm. But, it, you know, talk to me about this. Yeah, well, your, your challenge point framework gave construct to the philosophy 
of expansion and growth. And it's, it's been instrumental in helping me flirt with the edges and also conceptualize edges to other people and also giving people the permission to find their own journey and walk their own path and find their own edge. And you're right, a lot of people, especially this is why it's so important not to compete against others because if you compete against others, there's a chance you're gonna go too far too quick. Or if you're comparing your edge to somebody else's edge, there's a chance that you're going to push yourself back from your mm. meeting your edge, whatever that is and right. wherever that is. And so what's beautiful and I, what I love about the concept you created is that it's flexible. It evolves over time and there's a lot of room for us to be human in that space. Sometimes, like I always like to say, like it's not always about going hard and going hard. Sometimes it's about going hard and going soft. Can you go yeah. hard at rest? What is that edge? It's a beautiful foundation that a template for one to constantly put themselves in the optimal framework to not just grow, but to be well, holistically. Mm -hmm. And that's the beautiful thing about it. And so it, it requires discernment. It requires for us to constantly check in. It requires for us to constantly drop into presence to know who we are, where we are. And I feel that in that space, then we're not living in past or future. We're living in the present moment. And every moment becomes an opportunity to celebrate. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter if we're just starting out, we're young children, or we're deep into our senior years, each and every person can find that edge and inevitably play and dance in their potential. It's, it, it makes me think that the question that we ask a lot of times isn't the right question. You know, the, the question that a lot of achievers ask is how can I be the best? Mm -hmm. And the question probably should be how can I be my best? That's it. Right? And, and that frame really changes the way you go about it. That's it. That's it. Yeah, like just recently being in Thailand, if I would have competed against anybody else, I would have destroyed myself. I had to constantly come back to what feels right for me. And some days that meant I'd have a goal of running five miles at a certain time. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that meant I'm just walking. I'm just walking it. What, you know, what, what elite athlete is going to walk? Sometimes my brain would say. But that was what my body needed in those moments. Right. And, and to be able to listen to that, yeah. I think, is remarkable. I think, you know, this is where rising mm -hmm. above the ego mm -hmm. becomes so very important. And it's something that's so hard for people who have achieved because of the ego. Right. Right. So you're, and, and again, not to fight it, but to, to honor, thank you for getting me where I am. Right. And, and now I'm going to move beyond. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. You know, there's a, a <coughs> saying that I, I've loved this saying ever since I first heard it. It's that comparison is the thief of joy. 100%. And it's so hard to do. <laughs> it, it, it's so hard to do, yeah. um, especially in a society that has inundated us with inferiority since the time we were right. kids. Right. And... What's interesting about where Nike's going right now, they're going from a company that is aspirational, which is you need to become more, here's the aspiration, become more, become this, to you're already enough as is, become more of you. Huge, huge change yeah. with where they're going with some things right now. But this is where we're landing. I love the quote that goes, be yourself, everybody else is taken. Right. Or nobody is you. That is your superpower. Yeah. That's the magic is falling in love with what it is we are. Because there never has been, never will be again another one of us. It's a paradigm shift, right? Because yeah, yeah. we're we're taught in, if in school in any industry in, in any formal organization, mm -hmm. we're taught rank order. Yeah. We're taught <laughs> yeah. getting the answer wrong right. is is bad right right and and maybe on a test that's mm -hmm. true but certainly in the preparation for for the test or preparation for life mm -hmm. good for you yeah. right yeah you gave it a shot um you're in the game right right that's way better than sitting on the sidelines I, I would give this analogy to my class you know 
okay, how many of you work out? Most, you know, these college students, so most of them work out. And I said, if you go to the gym and you walk in the gym and you sit on the chairs and you watch people work out, are you going to get better shape? And they're like, no, of course not. But that's what you do in the classroom, mm. right? You walk in and you let other people answer questions. Mm. That's powerful. But I think we can expand it to life, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are a lot of people who aren't in the game. And, and I'm going to say this, although you, <clears throat> you know this, you preach this. This isn't condemnation of those people. Mm -hmm. This is just a mirror yeah. for all of us because there are sometimes I'm not in the game. Absolutely. Right? And, but we have to be in the game to win. Theodore Roosevelt, man, woman in the arena. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's easy to be he's like it's either to be the counselor of like deeds and all that sitting in the arena mm -hmm. but the real the real honor is to be in the arena scarred marred messing up failing but in there and all of us have the opportunity to step into that arena and only we know what our metaphorical arena is nobody can tell us that we could very well be successful on the outside in our society and still on the sideline. That's the real paradox and true. Because I know a lot of people who are really successful and society's like, keep going, got the perfect credit score, right. got the fat bank account, but they're not even in the game. Yeah, Their game, not my game, mm -hmm. not somebody else's game, but their game. Their game could be, they wanna be a, a potter. Right. Or a, a, a cow farmer or something like that. I don't know, but that's, that's the power of getting quiet enough, long enough to hear our truth. And then that's where the courage has to come in for us to follow that truth and walk towards that truth. And that can be very confronting because most people have never given themselves enough time to hear themselves. I ask people all the time, I'm like, when's the last time, when's the last time you just had a weekend where you didn't speak to anybody and didn't go on Instagram? Most people are like, I don't even know when that was. Years, decades. When you can't hear yourself, how do you know where you're supposed to go? How do you develop that trust and belief in yourself to say, this is what my soul is calling me towards. I need to go to this space. So it's an important time and age where as everything is speeding up, as AI is coming on full force, as everything is turning into warp speed, I truly believe the new most powerful currencies are going to be things like quiet, solitude, presence, breath, all the gems that come naturally to us at birth, those are going to be the most powerful tools to wield in this age of rapid expansion and information. I, uh, yeah, beautiful. And I, I agree with you. I think I would add one thing to it, and that's connection. And connection. Right. It's so important. Yeah. <laughs> it's so important. Because, you know, when you have something like AI, yeah. which can do so much for you, yeah. the one thing it can't do for you is connection. That's it. Right. That's it. And, and we're in a, there's a, there's a epidemic and an endemic of lack of connection. Mm -hmm. People need it so much and we're supposed to be in community. And that's the challenge of these times as well, especially with what COVID did. It pulled so many people away, but it also highlighted how important it is for us to be in community. And you're 100% right. Like the, the beautiful thing, one of the most beautiful things about my travels is when I go to places like Kenya and I had opportunity to be with the Maasai Mar or in Peru with the, the tribes, they're connected, they're laughing, they're together, they're in harmony with people. America at times, the West, so individualized, mm -hmm. you can live in a community of people and not know anybody. Right. You know, that's wild. It's it's probably one of the biggest causes of mental disease next to anything else I can imagine. Yeah, disease. Yeah, you yeah. can live in in next to somebody for years and not ever know the person, which is amazing. You you reminded me when you're talking about your travels, you uh you've been in Thailand for four months. Four months in Thailand. Right? And uh, tell us why, tell us what you learned, tell us that experience. Yeah, it's been so incredible, so beautiful. I, uh, as you know, my mother passed away mm -hmm. last June, just got to the one year anniversary. And it was wild because, you know, they found my mom on the sidewalk of right. Vegas. So 
it was ironic in the sense of the streets and what I have overcome. And then the streets, my mom dying literally on the streets, right. not in a hospital. It was uh, a part of my story that I, I'm just like, well, this, this, yeah, it was like, it, it just makes sense. It makes sense that this is going to be another thing that I can use to, you know, unlock myself on a higher level and tell the story. And one of the things I wanted to do by honoring my mom was to bring my greatness to life, to look at where I was playing small and lean in. And so as soon as she passed away, I was in Bali when it happened. I had my biggest speaking engagement to date, keynote speak engagement for one of the biggest companies in the game. And three days later, I did the keynote and leaned in. And so it was six months full force of using the grief to bring something to life through me that I've never brought before. And I continue to think about my mom because she, the, the, the death certificate said uh, heat exhaustion. Mm -hmm. So she basically cooked out there in the sun for like 24 hours in the middle of June. And it was wild because it was right on the sidewalk. So people walked over, her, but they thought like she was a homeless or something, but she was like dead. And so anytime I would feel the burn of like this next challenge, I would think about my mom. I'm like, my mom could like go through that, literally went to the edge and went beyond. I can do that as well. And so I brought so much to life, but by the time I got past December, six months later, I had put on 20 pounds. One of my go-tos when I'm stressed is cookies. Mm -hmm. Shout out to <laughs> all the great cookies out there. Yeah. And um, I, I was like, I need, I need to get quiet now. I had served so much with so much on my back, heartbroken. I needed to get quiet. And one of the places that I've always found nourishment is in Asia. And I said, not only do I need to get quiet, I need to get my health back because I'm feeling off. My body fat percentage was up 10%. My HRV was all off. Everything was just off. And so I went and I enrolled in a fight camp. Muay Thai is one of my most cherished art forms. And I, I leaned in and I, I got quiet. Nobody had access to me out there for four months. And over the course of four months, I did like 450 plus workouts, three workouts a day, four workouts a day, and just immersed myself in high quality nutrition and living like a fighter. And on the other side of the four months, I dropped 10% body fat. I brought all of my vital numbers back to normal. And I was able to like finally have the space to like process and grieve my mother's passing, but also celebrate her life at the same time. And it was, a, it was one of the greatest gifts ever. I, I'm really proud of myself at how I've been able to like take my best, one of my best friends passing away the way that she did um, and use it as a, a opportunity to expand and grow rather than letting the grief and the trauma use me. And I never really understood, like I hear people talking about they lost a loved one and all that. You can never speak about it, but it wasn't until like I saw my mother's body when I came back from Bali a couple weeks later that I was, it was like a spiritual chiropractic adjustment. I understood life on a whole different level. And I also understood the, 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 the temporary, temporariness of life. Like we all have these goals, we all have these dreams. The truth is the one thing we all have in common is that we're, gonna, we're born and we're gonna die. Mm -hmm. And when I was like cleaning out my mom's house, there was uh, a family history book to the 1400s on my English Irish side. So, wow. And she she created that. And the one thing I kept seeing in the history, her family his, our family history was a birth date, a dash and a death date. What does that dash symbolize? That dash is life. All of us are in that dash right now. Some of us are going to go hard and make that dash colorful, some of us are not. But that dash, what we do in that dash is everything. Inevitably, that's all we got. And so I saw all these dashes on this paper and I was like, you know what? I am going all out on my dash to honor my mom, to honor all the people who have laid it down for me, for my tribe, for my friends to be in this place right now where we are blessed. Yes, there's challenges, but we're in the situation where we live in a country where if you really want it, you can get it. Mm -hmm. Where we're healthy, where we're 
you know, we're, we're looked after, where we have challenges, but not nothing crazy. I was like, you know what? I'm going all out. So long story short, that, that experience with my mom changed the trajectory of my life. And Thailand was me putting the broken parts of me back together so that I could come online in a way that is in service to my community, to service to the blessed platform that I have to speak to so many people around the world in a way that like really speaks from the heart. And again, you know, when I declare mission, the love was my mission. Yeah, it's like whimsical. It's like, oh, love is my mission. As soon as I declare that, the universe was like, ha ha, you, oh, you want love is your mission? Let me show you everything that is not love. Mm -hmm. Let me show you all the facets of love. And that's really what it's been about. And my mother passing away brought me back to my heart. And Thailand helped me really like activate the lessons in here, not in like some whimsical way, but in a really powerful way. Yeah. Wow, man. Thank you for for talking about that. Yeah, for sure. I can see it. It's, it's still there with you, which it should be. It changed me forever. Yeah. And that's what I keep telling people. It's like that moment changed me forever. I, I can't explain it, but it was like the little boy in me, the... <laughs> what, what my brother John always says, you know, from Lord of the Rings, the Schmeagel, mm -hmm. yeah. like that part of me that like keeps playing small or like sabotaging, it got smacked and and put me in a che in, in check with myself and an understanding that time is of the essence and I don't have time to play, but I do have time to play right. if you know what I mean. Yeah, but like forward focus and so, yeah it. It's with me. I feel it in my eyes. I feel it in my heart. I yeah. feel it in my spirit. And it's one of my most cherished gifts as well. Like, I'm so happy that I was given that gift because it taught me to understand the sacredness of this even more. Yeah, the, the <clears throat> one of the things that you just said that's really struck me is the healing of the little boy, mm -hmm. right? And which, which gives you freedom. Yeah, exactly. Um, Robert Bly in Iron John, he speaks about it a lot. And it's it's this idea of suspended adolescence. We got a lot of grown kids. Yeah. And unfortunately in our society, where once upon a time there were initiatory practices that brought us into manhood, and usually through initiation, a means of contained encounter with the unknown, but community would always walk you there and walk you back. We don't have that. And so what happens is, is a lot of times our initiatory practices are rooted in toxic means like, you know, having sex for the first time or, you know, drinking or getting your home or getting money. We're all like silently trying to initiate ourselves. But things like death, that is like a tried and true initiatory experience that is ancient as they come. Mm -hmm. And I feel that um, with the right tools and the right context, everything then becomes an initiatory experience and we can really start to unlock a deeper level of ourselves. Part of the initiatory process in tribes was not for the individual. The individual was initiated to inevitably amplify the community. Right. That's why the community was vested in their initiatory process. And so I've learned to look at that as a young man, but a young chief that is coming into more and more positions of influence to look at these challenges that I'm given as an opportunity to serve my collective community even more. And my mother's death was a great example of that because it was very public. And I tried to share and showcase like, okay, this is really what it's about. This is my grief, this is my heartbreak. Like I put a post up on Instagram of me breaking down and bawling in the middle of the Amazon jungle. But I wanted to showcase like it is, it is okay to feel. Like this is part of it and it's mm -hmm. beautiful. And we're gonna continue to do better. We're not gonna let this define us. We're not gonna let this destroy us. We're not gonna let this bring out any toxic habits. In fact, we're gonna use this as a means to be even better, to, to love even deeper, to go even harder, and to celebrate even more. Go and pick up that celebrate even more. Yeah. Moments of joy for you. Oh, all day. <laughs> <laughs> I know, there are too many. What, <laughs> yeah. Tell me a few that just jump out at you. Oh my gosh. I mean, to be to be honest with you, at this juncture, it's all celebration. Like one of my greatest moments of joy is every morning I take about five minutes 
and I try to love myself as hard as I can. I just like go in my mind and I'm like, you're amazing. You're beautiful. You're great. And there's part of me that's like, no, you're not. No, you're not. But that moment right there is like me celebrating who it is I am. Because mm -hmm. inevitably, the relationship with myself is the only relationship I'm going to have from birth to death. People are going to come and go. But it's, it's that opportunity with me. It's interesting, you know, uh, think about, uh, so not including your mom, mm -hmm. but there are a lot of people in your life when you were learning about you mm -hmm. that were telling you the exact opposite. 100%. And now you're teaching yourself something different, which yeah. I think is really cool. I'm reparenting myself. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's <laughs> and, right. And I realized, like, one of the greatest unlocks I've ever had was when I realized that self. So as I've gotten to therapy and all that, I realized <clears throat> I've been speaking more about this, but like I had this whole palette of like psychosomatic things. Like there's been depression for sure. There's anxiety. There's uh, avoidant ang anxious attachment styles. There's abandonment wounds. There's savior complex. There's codependent tendencies. These are all mechanisms that are a result of, you know, traumas and adverse childhood experiences mm -hmm. that you use to cope. And coming online, I would see these things pop up into my relationships and stuff like that. And then a moment hit me where I realized, like when I feel abandoned, I abandon myself, and things like that. That self-worth and self-love, when they're truly locked in, you create an environment, not only that is optimal and healthy, but you create an environment that ends up healing those things. And so the last few years, my journey into self-worth and self-love has really helped me put all of those things in, in check. It's, it's taught me how to really set proper boundaries. It's taught me to ask help for when I need help. It's taught me to nurture that inner child when he's throwing an absolute temper tantrum in this like top-down, bottom-up thing where I'm sitting there holding my inner child and saying like, it's all good, you're beautiful still, even though you might not think you are. These things right here have put me in a position like where self-love and self-worth is becoming more of my set point rather than something else. And that right there, out of everything I've ac accomplished, the journey from the streets to the skies, that is my most cherished possession, is to be able to sit with myself long enough and not be in turmoil with myself, but be in a space of like, I'm good enough. Yeah, which is, I mean, that is absolutely priceless. And I think you know, again, going back to your mom, I think a lot of that is some of the seeds she planted yeah, a long yeah, time ago. 100%. You know, one of the things that strikes me about this is there are tools that you use, right? So talk about the t some of the tools that you use. You talked about your five minutes in the morning, part of your yeah, ritual, yeah. right? But what are some of the other tools that you use to get you to the place that you want to be, to get you in Dharma? That's a great question. Um, no matter where I'm at, and I've seen this firsthand, you can go to Bali, you can go to Thailand, you can go to India, wherever you go, there you are. Yeah. So it's not like you go to these places and things don't come with you. You come with you. The, the morning rituals and the evening rituals are everything. And the morning rituals are elemental. Getting sunshine, getting enough water. You know, for those that don't have clouds or don't have sunshine, it's cloud cover there's still UV out there. Mm -hmm. Getting outside, letting that natural light wake you up is everything. Moving, moving in the morning. We say a lot of times eating the frog, doing a hard thing in the morning right, right off the bat. Movement um, is pivotal for, for my own personal expression. And moving with purpose is everything. So I want to stop yeah. there because I, I happen to agree with you about this. And, and if... The only thing, and I say it like that because it's really not the only thing, mm -hmm. but if the only thing you do is drink a glass of water, go outside, and move. Walk, yoga, yeah. um, just move however you want to move. You've already made such a yeah. significant upgrade. You know, you talk about video games. That's the level up right there. That's the level up. If that's yeah. all you do. Yeah. That's all you do, yeah. And, and you know... I say that almost in a flippant way because it doesn't seem like much. It is a game changer. It's everything. Yeah. It's everything. And do that regularly on a regular basis for long enough, and you will not be in the same place you are. That's like one of the – there's not a lot of universal truths, right, right. Dr. G? 
But, but one of the universal truths I think we both know is if you move every day purposely, purposefully, you will not be in the same place you were when you started. Right. I mean, it's it sounds really simple, mm -hmm. right? And and in some regard, it is. Yeah. Right. It's just you just do that. Right. Um, but you're you're also working against back to the brain thing. You're working against what's comfortable. Yeah. And your brain's going to try and keep you in that old equilibrium yeah. state. Yeah. And. And, but it's so, so important mm -hmm. to be able to do that because what you're saying to yourself is, I love you. I'm going to do this for, for us. That's right. It. And, and the other piece that you're doing is you're starting your day in a center. When you start your day off kilter, man, it's hard to get it it's back. True. It's true. Right. So if, if you just are able to start it in center, You've given yourself a huge, huge head start. Absolutely. And those three things, you know, light, sunlight, yeah. uh, water, yeah. movement. Movement and maybe put the feet on the earth. Yeah. Then you got the whole elemental right. and breathing spirit, mm -hmm. all five elements. Right. A lot of people say, like, I want to be with somebody that makes me happy. And I'm all about crossing out that with. And it's yeah. just be somebody that makes you happy. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's beautiful. Man. That's the relationship. Say it again. A lot of people say be with somebody that makes you happy, and it's about crossing out that with and just being somebody right. that makes you happy. Yeah. Then, yeah. then people come in to our lives, and it's a compliment to us rather than a completion. Yeah. A lot of people are looking for people to complete them, and the only person that can complete us is ourselves. I, and I think you know this. You've talked about this a little bit as as we've been uh, talking. An incredibly important piece of this the morning routine, the being uh, the person that makes you happy. Mm -hmm. So much of that hinges on gratitude. Gratitude is the key. Yeah. It puts us, it puts us in a state of true presence. Like, I don't think you can be grateful and not, pre you can't be grateful <laughs> and, and right. not present. Right. And we know present is the gift. Mm -hmm. And there's so much empirical research and data that shows it. Like, simply by writing down three things you're grateful for every day, empirically, shifts our overall well-being well as a master's student in positive yeah. psychology you know these things right yeah. i mean the study after study after study yeah one of my favorites which i think <clears throat> turned out to be an accidental study was and, and i know you know this one where they would this kind of dates it they would have these beepers on people because they wanted to see if they were happier during different times of the day and so they would beep them at different times of the day and you, and then you'd go to a payphone, right, and or write down what it is that you were thinking, and they found out that it didn't seem like there was one time a day that people were more happy. But the really curious finding was those people that were in the study, they, as you tr look at trends, their happiness trend increased across time, and they're, they're like, what, what's going on here? And what they found out it was about being present. That's it, right? That's it. Which is is crazy to think about, right? How important that is yeah. to be present. Especially okay, I cut you off. More tools. Tell us, give us more tools. Yeah, um, I feel that. I feel that one of the most powerful tools that I've incorporated is giving myself the permission and feeling like I'm worthy enough to have a team around me. Mm -hmm. And when I look at all the greats, you know. Muhammad Ali's, LeBron's, Maya Angelos, whoever it may be. <clears throat> All of them have teams around them that are helping them see themselves and be their best selves. And a lot of times when I bring up this concept of team, think people are like, well, I can't afford a team. It doesn't always have to be uh, a team of, quote, unquote, the best trainers, the best coaches, but loving ourselves enough to surround ourselves with the people that bring us bring us to life, that expand us rather than make us shrink is everything. That's the basis of a team. So creating your own Avenger squad and knowing that your team, your community, again, has your back, mm -hmm. is gives, gives us the courage to inevitably begin to play with our potential, to go out there on the limb and ledge and know that we're not alone or know that it, there's lifelines that we can call if we need to is everything. And so I would say one of the constants throughout my day at this juncture is that I know I have a great team and I constantly try to check in with certain team members on a regular basis. Some are friends, some are mentors, so some are 
like my therapist, my life coach, my Muay Thai teacher, um, things like that, that are all there, like pushing me towards my potential. Sometimes I don't even know what my potential is, but then I'll have like a teacher mentor like you who all of a sudden helps me see myself in a better, in a more clear way or see the path in a more clear way. Why don't you try this? Why don't you go this way? Maybe look at things like this. These are a constant and these really are what bring a lot of life to my day. And then for me, time is everything. And so knowing how I'm spending my time is key. And one thing I love is like, I think it's 164 hours in a week. We all have the same amount of hours in a week. How we use that time is everything. A lot of people don't realize that the three hours a day that they spend on that Instagram and social media equates to 10,000 hours over 10 years. So the truth is all of us have the opportunity to be at least a master in one thing, mm -hmm. let alone many things. But if we don't use that time in the right way, instead of us creating a life that is of well-being and of abundance and of truth, we're creating a life that is, we're feeding our energy into something that is soul sucking rather than soul expanding. The, t the team piece, I think, is really interesting because um, you're right. You don't need to hire a team, mm. right? And, I mean, you can, certainly, but mm. you don't need to. And most of us have people in our lives or could get people in our lives who could be part of our team. Mm. And most of us have people who are in our lives who shouldn't be part of our team. Truth. And I think the thing is that... Um, and I, again, I say this without judgment, but a lot of times we aren't telling ourselves the things that we should be telling ourselves mm -hmm. about the people who we're around. Yeah, yep. You know, does this person support my who I am at my best? Absolutely. Right? And it's not a good or bad person. Mm -hmm. It's a do they support my dharma? Do they support where I need to go? Mm-hmm. And sometimes the answer is yes, and sometimes it's no, right? Yeah. But a lot of times we won't ask that question. It's so important to ask. Yeah. When you think about it, one of the things that I constantly speak about is building a championship team. Mm -hmm. The truth is, and we, one of the greatest teams there ever was, and the team I often referred to was the Bulls. The Bulls, yeah. Yeah, the Bulls were a team of characters. Right. And I'm sure you've seen the last dance, right? Well, I think, I mean, I, I don't know if you'll talk about this, but I think about Rodman. Yeah. Right? As, as speaking of characters. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, they, they had all types of characters, but they were all committed to a cause, to a mission, to being the best. And the right. truth is, there were 30 or 28 plus other NBA teams that season. We don't really remember anybody else. Mm -hmm. That team right there had a particular mission, and they did it, and they replicated it over and over again. When it comes to our lives, we have to put together the right personnel. And that personnel can look like the melody of characters that were on the Bulls. But if they're not committed to the mission of our own truth, then they're distracting from the mission. Right. And unfortunately, if you really want to be great, you can't have five people pulling you forward and one person pulling you back. Sometimes, yes, we have family we can't choose and we are we have to deal with the intricacies of having like, you know, a crazy sister or something like that or brother or whatever. But outside of that, when it comes to the people that choose we choose to be in our lives, for us not to choose people that are all in the affirmative is actually a self-sabotaging mm -hmm. behavior. And that can be painful. Because sometimes that means letting go of the people that no longer serve us. Sometimes that means having hard conversations with friends. Sometimes that means walking away from a relationship that is actually not in alignment. But when we're rooted in self-worth and committed to self-love, and we start to really understand that it, life is already hard, it doesn't have to be hard all the time, or we don't have to make it harder on ourselves, it can be easy. That's when we start to clear the way in uh in Sanskrit, we say, Om Gan Ganapataye Namaha. That's Ganesha, clear the way, the great remover of obstacles. We clear the way so that um, it becomes easier. And when we're going at warp speed, we need <laughs> the debris out of the road. Right. My, 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 the message that kept coming to me uh, when we were in the jungles in uh, the Amazon was 
it doesn't have to be hard, but you make it that way. A lot of us do. And uh, by the way, I'm just thinking, I was thinking about when we were talking about the Bulls, I wonder who my Dennis Rodman is, you know, (laughs) in my my group. But um, I want to know. Yeah, I have to think about this, actually. You might have a few. I have a few Dennis Rodman. <laughs> <laughs> I might have a team of Dennis so, Rodman. <laughs> so uh, a lot of rebounds coming. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. you talked a little bit about mentors, right? Yeah. I know your mom's one of them. Yeah, absolutely. one of my greatest. Who are a few of your other mentors and why? Well, Dr. G, you're, you're one of Thank my mentors you. 100% you. by how you live, by how you love, by how you lead, by how you see, and how you put things together, and how you walk. And, how, and what you embody. And it's been an honor to be able to create with you. And I love time because time shows cases what behind closed doors, what people are really doing. And it's cool to always see you tinkering in the metaphorical laboratory of your mind and your heart to expand. So I'm, I'm so grateful. I, I am grateful for you. Yeah. I, I really appreciate you saying that. And yeah. the time piece is so, it's crazy, right? Yeah. I mean, it was years ago when you came in and wanted to do a PhD, yeah. and you're the first really great student that I said no to. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. it was like the nicest no ever. Yeah, seven because years because you had more things that you needed you want, to do. You 100. percent And now it. here you're back, right? It's an honor. It's uh, I yeah, needed it. Yeah, for both of us. Yeah, for both of us. So it, who else? Um, Mr. Mahalan at the Community College of Southern Nevada. He was the first one to ever look at me and see something in me. He was the one who started feeding me books. I'm 19 years old. He's feeding me Nietzsche. He's feeding me Plato. My whole entire world is collapsing because it's like now I'm questioning God and questioning everything. I remember when I first got to the community college, I had like this uh, God Bless Africa t-shirt. And he's a, he's a African-American individual. And he goes, why are you wearing that shirt? And I said, well, you know, it's all about Africa, the, the people. And he was like, let me give you the history of Africa. He made me dive into the history of Africa. He made me like look at it completely different. But he was all about critical thinking, and he was all about unlocking the life and the mind. <clears throat> and so he he changed he changed my life. Doctor Norwood. He was a mentor who, under his supervision for three years, I did over nine thousand training sessions. Each one analyzed in depth, and he opened up the doors for me to fall in love with psychology. My mentor, Lisa Sue, she was my first life coach who helped me uh, start to see my worth and work through the psychosomatic issues of growing up in the streets and healing that. My therapist, Pedge, therap- he, I mean, Pedge, is, he's great. He, he, uh, he's always like just in this calm demeanor and then all of a sudden he kind of gets gangster and we call it hot fire, fire <laughs> therapy and then he checks me. <laughs> and there's a, there's a, a, a ton of others that I've met on my yeah, my journey. A lot of hidden masters. I always say like the masters we know about are just students of the masters we know nothing about at all. And so like Wolf, who you met, mm-hmm. and like some of the shamans in Peru, some of my master yoga teachers, and and obviously uh, my mother. My mother is one of my greatest mentors, and she gave me God and gratitude, and, and you can't ask for more than that. Yeah. Agreed. Okay, uh, I got one more question for you. Let's do it. Predict the next step of your hero's journey. All right. You ready for the drum yep, roll? I am. The next step of the, the hero's journey is fatherhood. Ah. Yeah. This is in the works, I take it. Well, this is this is something my, I, I prepped my body for. Okay. I uh, I wanted, I, I know that it's on the horizon. And so I spent also the last six months getting my body ready just to energetically be in alignment to bring life to life. After I experienced death with my mom, the other great gem that I want to experience is mm-hmm. to be a, a father and to to bring that, to bring a person into the world and to create that magic with the right individual. And so that's uh, that's the next that's the next win. You're going to be a great parent, and it, it will open up a whole new world for you. I can't wait. I got yeah. a lot of good mentors that teach me how to be <laughs> pops. Yeah. Well, thank you so much yeah, for yeah. being here. It's an, it's an honor, man. It is an honor to me, too. You are my brother. Right back at you. Thank you. Appreciate you. Thank you. Love you. Love Proud you of you. Too. Shout out to the Academy. <laughs> Boom. Boom. Thanks for listening. As always, we're grateful for your time and attention. If you enjoyed this episode, please check out our other podcasts on Spotify and Apple. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and share with others that you care about. Thank you.